everyone. Welcome to Brookline Booksmith. My name is Silas. A few housekeeping notes. Please keep your phones on silent. If you haven't picked up a book, you can do so in the back after the event, uh, whether that be a pre-order or we have books for sale. And there will be time for a Q&A. So get your questions ready. We're here tonight to celebrate the release of Kissing Kosher with author Jean Meltzer in conversation with Lucy Keating. Lucy <laughs> is the author of three young adult romance novels, Dreamology, Literally, and Ride With Me, the truth of her sale back there. She's been writing and editing romance for well over a decade since getting her start as a teen hitmate with the teen hitmaker Alloy Entertainment. And her work has been translated into 17 languages. She is a graduate of a Williams College, and she lives in Somerville with her husband, baby boy, and disgruntled senior dog. Welcome, <laughs> Jean Meltzer studied dramatic writing at NYU Tisch and has earned numerous awards for her work in television, including a daytime Emmy. She spent five years in rabbinical school before her chronic illness forced her to withdraw, and her father told her she should write a book, just not a Jewish one, because no one reads those. <laughs> we beg to differ. Welcome, Jean. Kissing Kosher is truly a hilarious and emotional rivals to lovers romance. Step one, get the secret recipe. Step two, don't fall in love. Avital Cohen isn't wearing underwear, woefully for unsexy reasons. Chronic pelvic pain has forced her to sideline her photography dreams and her love life. All, it's all she can manage to, it's all she can do to manage her family's kosher bakery, best vodka in Brooklyn without collapsing. She needs hired help. And distractingly handsome Ethan Lippman seems the perfect fit. Except Ethan isn't there to work. He's undercover at the behest of his iron-fisted grandfather. Though Lippman is a household name when it comes to mass-produced kosher baked goods, they don't have the charm of Abital's bakery and her grand or her grandmother's world famous pumpkin spice vodka recipe. As they bake side by side, Ethan soon finds out finds himself more interested in Avital than in stealing family secrets, especially as he helps her find the chronic pain relief and pleasure that she's been missing. But perfecting the recipe for romance calls for leaving out the lies, even if coming clean means risking it all. Please welcome Lucy Keating and Jean Nelson. I need to speak into this. Um, I'm so excited. To, I'm so close to you. I'm so excited to be here talking to you about this book. I emailed you gushing a few nights ago um, with all of my questions. And um, there's so much to sort of get into. Uh, one of my, this book was sort of like, in some ways, what I expected and hoped for in that it's so warm and romantic and funny and what you sort of think you're going to get when you see this cover and you read about it. And then it also had so much depth to it and so um, many topics covered. I think, as I said to you, you like just weren't afraid to go there with a lot of um, with a lot of the things that you wrote about. So I just we're going to touch on a lot of different things, and so <laughs> bear with us. Um, I'm like not used to such a big. I feel like I'm more nervous tonight than normal. Um, so I think the first thing that I really wanted to talk about was obstacles and tension um, in romance. Something I think about in my work is um, what kind of obstacles are you creating between the main characters to really get that like beautiful tension between them. Um, because honestly, like when we meet Avatar and Ethan, we're kind of like, great, like why would they just be together? Like they're, they both are interested in each other. They're both like, that person's super hot. Um, and yeah, there are these like very sincere reasons why uh, they can't be together. And when I was reading it, I was like, oh my God, how are they gonna get around this? Um, and I, I Something I think about is like internal and external obstacles. And so I think in romance a lot you see um, 
internal obstacles, which is like where a person says, oh no, I've been hurt before and I can't let anyone in and we can't be together and I'm gonna hurt you. Um, and, but what you have in yours is like some very real external stuff that have me being like, I'm, I have to keep turning these pages because I don't know how they're gonna do this and I think how you end up resolving it is very special. Um, but I wonder if you would, yeah, talk a little bit about how you created the things that Avatar and Ethan are up against and how it affects their journey and their relationship to each other. So I'll start by saying <clears throat> two things that you should know about me in terms of the books I write. The first is that at least for the last three books, my characters have very much, and my storyline, have very much been influenced by things I've experienced myself. So my first book, Mott's Ball, was influenced by my experience with uh, MECFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, which I've worked with for over 20 years, as well as my love of Christmas. My second book, uh, <laughs> nice Jewish girl. My second book <laughs> was uh, influenced by my, we were talking in the back room, my husband converted when I met him. He was a very handsome soldier, but he was not Jewish, and I was a rabbinical student. So we had a little bit of a problem there. Um, and my third book was uh, influenced also by the fact that in 2020, right around the same time, I learned that the matzo ball was going to become a book. Um, I woke up with what I thought was a UTI, a urinary tract infection. And that began uh, doctor's appointments, eight rounds of antibiotics, three specialists, and thus I officially became a chronic pelvic pain patient. And so in terms of uh, the obstacles, you know, when you become a chronic pain patient and you're once again maneuvering the medical system, you, you do all sorts of things. You go to the doctors, you go on forums, you try to find people, you talk to people. And the thing I kept hearing over and over again from other women who were experiencing the same thing, who were not in relationships like me, uh, was that no one will ever love me because I can't have sex. And so I knew for my third book, because it's a Gene Meltzer book, I was like, I want to tackle sexual dysfunction in a romance. And my publisher was like, great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I did wrong. Um, <laughs> um, and then the second thing you need to know about my books is that they're heavily influenced by my Jewish worldview. In fact, I would say I did not realize how super Jewy I am until after the Matzo Ball published. And I was like, wait, people didn't get that? They didn't understand? Da, 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 da. So when I chose to put it in the bakery and, and the issues with the families, this sort of modern day Romeo and Juliet, I was absolutely thinking about the holiday of Purim. Purim, we say, our sages say, Purim is when we take the mask and this is very much a story about people in costumes who take their masks off. Um, if you know anything about the hamantash, and I'm doing this, hamantash and cookies we eat, little triangle-shaped cookies with raspberry and strawberry jams inside of them. They are most known for being Haman's hat, the bad guy in our story. Um, but they are also known as fertility cookies originally, and they were shaped as a woman's pelvis. So I knew it was gonna be set in a bakery. I knew this was gonna be a story about taking masks off. I knew that this was going to be a Purim book. Um, and also the, this complication of the family. In Judaism, we say, when you marry the girl, you marry the family. Maybe other cultures have this, yes? Yes, yes. okay. <laughs> so when you marry the girl, you marry the family. Through the door of a door of a gym, generation to generation, everything in Judaism is transmission. So you can't write a book without the family, without the community. A Jewish book is always centered in a Jewish world, in my opinion. Um, you just answered one of my the question farther down the list was, I felt like when I was reading this book, it was a story as much about family as it was about romance. And that was my question. One of my questions to you was like, would you say this is you know just as much um, about family as romance, but it sounds like the two, it's so woven It's so together. intertwined. Even, you know, and I've been thinking about it more because my next book deals with like sort of memory and things like that. But this idea 
of transmission in Judaism, that you will tell your children, that you keep repeating, that my story is your story, it's all our story. Um, there's no real se segregation of identity when you really think about Judaism from the I to the community. So yeah, it, of course there's family, there, there's that warmth, there's all that other stuff. Too. Yeah, and all of the like... And the trauma. The trauma, <laughs> the trauma and um, the, the two grandfathers that have been feuding for decades. Uh, I, I think I told you that I looked forward to hopefully, and I <clears throat> But I like a, a resolution between them as, as much as I wanted to see the main characters. Obviously in every romance, it's like, you know, up and down. <laughs> Fighting and getting it together and in both with um, the two families I was. And I thought structurally, actually, you, you kind of, you, you structured that so that some of the, there is a lot of family resolution towards the end, which is actually normally where you might have uh, the ro romantic resolution. And so that, I thought that was really beautiful. I think Judaism, or at least the, the way my faith is, is that, uh, and my love story within my faith, is that, um, you know, sometimes you find the right person, but there can be outside influences that keep you apart. And I think when you love your family or you love your community and you fall in love with someone you're not supposed to, you know, it's a very real problem, but it's also a good stake in romance. Right, because it's much easier than oh, I've been, or much more difficult to possibly give up your family or your family business or whatever than it, you know oh, I'm going to be hurt again. Yeah. So when you talk about stakes, yeah, yeah, it adds that you know, and I'm sure you have a writing background too. So that idea that you need to constantly be layering those stakes, right? Yeah. Really it. Yeah, and like how I sort of think of it as like mountains of each with each step you're going higher and higher and lower and yeah, lower, yeah. dropping lower and lower with yeah. each. And there's the like, this, the main character is sad moment. Yes. Um, uh, so sort of thinking about obstacles in this relationship, um, the next thing I thought a lot about reading your book was likability of, of the characters. And um, when you meet Ethan immediately, he's like, so nice. He's like this <laughs> deeply kind. Uh, and, and, and one thing I thought that was interesting about that is in, in a lot of my work, I come up, I write YA, but I also have some adult romance in, in my life. And usually when you come across uh, a male love interest from like a privileged background, particularly a business background, I'm used to seeing characters who are kind of have a lot of walls built up. They're kind of tough on the exterior and actually their journey is more like, I have to learn to let people in. I have, you know, and Ethan is, he's, he's set about doing something that's pretty difficult and, you know, unkind, but right away he's like, I hate that I'm doing this, but I have to do this. And I wondered in writing his character, did you ever think about, I mean, actually make him sort of, you know, harder to reach at first and, and see them warm up? Or were you always like, no, this is going to be like a good guy right off the bat? That's what he wants. I think I always, especially when it comes to writing romance. I think your hero, for me, I think the hero has to be, I always try to write towards the goodness of the world. So for me, the hero, I want my hero to be likable. I think all my heroes are somewhat broken. I think that's slightly yeah. different in my books in that I don't, Judaism, we don't really have this concept of perfection, right? Um, God only works through broken vessels. Uh, all my heroes are struggling just as much as the heroes. Um, I think for Ethan, I, you know, I think a very sexy Jewish romance character is a mensch, right? He's a, he's a, and really what a mensch is, is, is literally it means man in Yiddish, but like it's this idea that it's someone who's constantly striving to be better, to be part of, to reach towards heaven, right? And I think what you see in my books is that they all come from backgrounds where there are challenges, whether it's emotional pain, whether it's chronic pain, um, whether it's abuse, whether it's um, uh, dealing with tragedy, um, but that they're all, even though they're struggling and they're not perfect and they make bad choices a lot of time, they are constantly striving to be better. But absolutely, with Ethan going in, I knew I was, I was very, I wanted to be sure that he was likable. I mean, that was, I, that was my, 
in a way a bigger challenge than I mean. Yeah. I mean, and I think you did that so well because I just thought about it a lot when I was reading it of like, wow, he's, you know, we're watching him continue to fall in love with her and he's he's really, it's a big lie um, behind under the surface, but it doesn't stop you from falling for Ethan as a reader. And I'm gonna, my husband wishes he was here now. But, um, <laughs> I'm gonna say actually a lot of all my male caregiver characters are based on my husband and my relationship with my husband. And the reason I did do this too is, is I go back to sort of my first, um, when everybody was saying, who will love me like this? I hear that, I've heard this so many times since be coming open about chronic illness, who will love me, who will love me? And what I, what I try to tell people is I've been sick a very long time. I have a lot of chronically ill and chronically disabled friends. And all of them who have wanted to be married and be in partnerships found people who love them and care for them and take care of them. We are, people sometimes think of our disability as like that's all we are, and we're not. We have so much worth, we are not invalid, right? We are, we have things to give back just as much to healthy people as healthy people have to give to us. So, you know, any one of my friends who have been sick, it's in married, still married, great relationships, and the ones who are not, it has nothing to do with their chronic illness. And so for me, I guess, not only am I modeling what I've seen in my relationships, in my own relationship, and how someone can love you unconditionally no matter what the challenge is, but I want also women to understand that this is not just a chronic illness fantasy. We deserve them, for sure. <laughs> Chronically ill people deserve their own types of romantic fantasies, and that includes a man running to get you a heating bag. Right? That, that for me, as I like to joke, I am here for the billionaire who does laundry. <laughs> like, not just the billionaire, but he's got to like clean the house, and make the dinner, and all that stuff too. Because I, for me as a chronically ill person, I sometimes need caregiving. So I think all of that in terms of the book is, it's not just an example of how love can be, but it's also like, you deserve that. We deserve that. Yeah, I mean, I, I it makes me think, and I, be careful saying this because I, I, it makes me think that like I would have liked to, as a person without chronic illness, I think everyone deserves to hear that you're not a broken person. And you're not you're a married. bird. And, yeah. And, and that like, we're all broken. Yeah. We all have that. Right. 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 And you're still lovable. I think there's a lot of, yeah, when I was single, I would have loved to have heard that. And there's a lot of single people I know who I'd like to say that <laughs> too. And it's interesting, you know, I, I don't know if we'll get into it here, but I talked a bit on my social media about Jewish sex and the Jewish worldview of sex and intimacy. And I think the thing that's gonna blow your mind <laughs> is that sex is one part of many, many things that Judaism values in a relationship. It's one part. So I said to someone very recently, I think it was on a podcast, that if you went to your rabbi and you're like, this girl is perfect, she's perfect, she's perfect, but you know, the sex is a little off. The rabbi would say, what are you, crazy? Go be with the girl. Like, the, because sex is gonna change. It's gonna change with kids. It's gonna change with marriage. The chemistry will be different. Sex is one part of a long relationship you're gonna have to work on. And so when I write romances, like those are the worldviews and values that I put into my books. Yeah, and you can see in your character, there's so much intimacy between the intimacy. characters that go on beyond yeah. sex. Um, and that, that, but on that note, I was really, interested in the piece you describe where like, and now I'm, I'm not gonna explain this, and you will, you will explain it, <laughs> but like um, the idea that the, the, the woman uh, makes the boundaries. Yeah, the woman sets the boundaries. Yes, and yeah. she isn't as smart. <laughs> <laughs> so, do a quick, quick rundown on Jewish law and sexuality. So the rabbis held the belief that women were as sexual, if not more sexual than men. They also held the belief that men often used the power dynamics of their society in order to control and hurt women. They were very concerned about both. So based on Torah law, they legislated all sorts of laws that protected the rights of women sexually. So for example, when a woman gets married, she signs a ketuba, a marriage contract, every Jewish woman, they're nodding their heads, you get shelter, you get clothing, and you get ona, response. What that means is that the woman at any point can go to her husband and say, I want sex, and he must respond. 
The man has no right to sex or pleasure in the marriage. Now, obviously, you are supposed to both work on it, but it is absolutely <laughs> the woman's job. The man is not allowed to coerce her. A man is not allowed to take a job that may pull him away from home if it affects his ability to give her sex when she wants it. So there were all sorts of, you're, you guys are laughing because you're going to go home, tell your boyfriends, <laughs> partners, whatever, you're going to be like, we are Jewish on this day. <laughs> we're going to get it done. Um, and, you know, but the other part of it is that there's something in Judaism called Nidah, which are boundaries around menstruation, where you don't have sex. And the point of this, if you want the sociological reasons for it, was that you go two weeks without being able to touch your partner, or have your partner, or whatever, and then she goes to the mikvah at night, she immerses, she comes out, and then what happens? They haven't seen each other, they haven't touched each other, she's at her most fertile point, and what do you think happens? They do it, and they make babies. Okay, very smart, Judaism super smart how they did this, but there's something beautiful in what they also found is that Orthodox Jews serve these rules, have the most satisfying sexual relationships. So there is something about creating boundaries and space and like crafting out time or putting it on a schedule, I guess, that uh, increases intimacy and partner. The other big thing in Judaism is sex is not for procreation. The point of sex in Judaism is to increase the, the bonds between a husband and a wife. So sex can be done if you're infertile, sex can be done when you're in menopause, sex can be done in any way you like, um, as long as it's increasing the bonds. And so this is, these are very different worldviews than you see in most romances, I would say, Absolutely. right? So I can only write from my worldview, but I think that I always say to you, and that has such a like, especially in terms of love and intimacy, such a beautiful, uh, tradition that anybody can take bits and pieces from, and you know, I love that I get to share what I love about my faith with others. Yeah, and I, I mean, I already learned this when I read the book, <laughs> and I and I didn't know any of what you're talking about. We already discussed how, like, uh, you know, I'm like an Irish Catholic girl from Boston. I have a lot, I have a lot to understand here, and um, you do such a great job of explaining and not make, you know. In, in a way that's really organic within the pages. Um, and, uh, but when I was reading all about this, I was like, this is extremely erotic. Like this is just like, and, and you do not, um, you, just, you just don't see that in, in a lot of the romances that I have read previously. Um, so I think you've touched on some of the, what I wanted to get into about chronic pain. And, um, but I guess now that we're sort of talking about it, cause I was, I was I was very moved by the elements about chronic illness and pain that you talk about. And I think as a woman, um, just you get to, as you age, you start to be like, I'm going to my doctor and they seem to be telling me they can't help with this thing because like nobody's done any research on it. And you're like, this was my, this wasn't my uterus. Like, would we have done research on it? Yes, probably. Um, and I just was, I found all of that parts of the book really powerful and I guess, I didn't think of it as feminist when I was reading it, um, but it is. It's interesting, you know, I I wouldn't use that word necessarily either because it wasn't on my mind. Yeah. What, uh, for me, you know, I always tell people I was an advocate. I worked as an ME action advocate. I did events in Washington, D.C. I met with congressmen and senators. So I was an advocate long before I ever became an author with a big A. And so when I sat down to write this book, especially having seen the impact of the Moss Ball on the chronic Korean community, um, I did not want to sanitize the experience of chronic pain or chronic disability at all. I, for me, it is such a disservice when a chronic illness or a chronic disability is a throwaway line in a book. If it's something, because it doesn't increase understanding of what our lives actually look like. Um, and also, all, everything she goes through with like the medical community, the, the possibility of, of suicide, um, the lack of care, the opioid crisis. I felt if I did not talk about these things, if I did not write these things, it would be a disservice to the 88 million people who live with chronic pain in America. 
so it wasn't, I wouldn't even say it was feminist as much as like, I'm always thinking about like, what does my reader need? What do they need to hear? What do they, what is the healthy reader? What is the, and also that, again, chronically ill people deserve to be seen. We deserve to have our own stories and our own fantasies and our own sexual fantasies too. And what my job is to create that. There's a really wonderful scene in the book where, um, Ethan has been upstairs cleaning up part of the bakery that uh, caught fire because it's crowded with old things. And he asks for permission to um, fix up one particular room and he basically creates like a nest for Avital to, to be in and, um, when she's in pain and she's at work. And like, it is truly like the most romantic <laughs> thing ever. Like, it's like a bed. <laughs> it's like, yeah. like a bed and a place, I noted, like a place for her to put her laptop yeah. and like, and work. But also I imagine myself like just like, you know, streaming like some, something when I, you know, when we I need that. We all need our little high meal, yeah. right? We all need our little space. And I, you know, the thing about that room is like when Ethan makes it, I think he needs it too. So, because they're both, again, they're both dealing with pain. So I know I also wrote this to you. One, one thing I was curious about, um, I loved Rabbi Jason. There's this, I mean, speaking of pain, there's like this point, I don't know who's read the book, who's, who, um, yeah, but uh, they, when Amadal is, she's struggling, she's struggling with her pain and nothing is working and there's so much wrapped up in that, that's so well told. Um, and Ethan takes her to, basically, it's like, he, he has a grow, it's a rabbi with a, it's a grow house, but he also, it's so wrapped up in like faith and community as well. Um, and I was just like, I was wondering if that was real because I was just like, this is, un for, my, for myself, no, just, I was like, this is amazing. Like this character is amazing. Like, so let me tell you a story. <laughs> I don't know where to begin this story, but um, I'll start at the very beginning. So I'm in pain. I, my doctors are not capable of making my pain better. Uh, the medicines are not working, surgery doesn't do anything, I am in, I'm not sleeping, and I am like, to my husband, maybe we should try weed, medical cannabis. <clears throat> Wasn't, you know, I'm a martini girl, <laughs> that's usually my drug of choice, aside from like maybe an experience or two in high school, I have anxiety, it was not my thing. But I am desperate, I am desperate, so I start like looking into it, I'm like, what, what am I gonna do? I don't know anything. Right? All I did was in a parking lot smoke a joint, right? <laughs> and I didn't like it. <laughs> Martinis. Um, and, you know, so I'm searching, I'm searching, and I, I, the number one sort of dispensary to come alone is Washington, D.C. So I'm like looking at it, I'm like, okay, hold my neck and, you know, figure out how to do this. And then I'm doing research, and I realize it's run by a rabbi. And I was like, the skies opened up, and I was like, it's kosher. God wants me to go to this. I am, and that that began my journey of like going to this weed dispensary. And you walk in, and there's hamzas and you know uh, house blessings on the walls, and then tons of weed everywhere. And when I was writing the book, I actually contacted the weed rabbi, the, the person who owns it, and it turns out the entire family became rabbis and then went into the dispensary business. <laughs> so all this, the, the, I, then I talked to the son who works in the grow garden and he's like doing all these products and he's actually an advocate and he goes over and he does like all this Toro weed talks and then and to the point where, you know, this last weekend I was driving into BC to, you know, pick up my stash <laughs> and uh, uh, my, my husband's waiting in the car and it's really hot, so I'm putting, you know, in the front seat and someone knocks on the door. And I'm like, the window, and I'm like, oh, we're getting in trouble because we put it in the front seat. And I don't know what the rules are. But, <laughs> <laughs> and so the guy, like, my husband rolls it down, and he's like, I'm sorry, I saw your kippa, because my husband's wearing a yarmulke. And he's like, I don't know if you know this, but my parents are Rabbi Jeffrey Cotton. And I was like, oh, you're the other son. <laughs> so, like, all of them work in the business. and. You know, in my book, because it's a rom-com, he's like a tantric smoking naked rabbi. <laughs> because we all know that rabbi, at least I do. <laughs> we all know that one rabbi. He's <laughs> like, if you're, if you're in the Jewish world, you're not. But, um, but basically, like, they are, they are the most 
beautiful people. They it really, for them, is a human rights issue. It's a social justice issue. Um, they got into it because the father had MS and could not have his symptoms treated. And they tell a story that I will repeat now, which was when they first opened in DC, they were one of the first, there was a, a shooting. Uh, I guess someone was trying to rob them. And so they closed up the store, they're like patching up holes, it's like Christmas day. And as they're doing it, a woman comes up with tears in her eyes and she's like, please, I need this store to be opened, I need my medicine. And they said from that day on, they never closed again. They are open 24 seven because they cannot, it is such a social justice issue because for many, many people, this is the only thing keeping them functioning legally right now. Yeah, I thought about it because I, when I had was struggling with my own pelvic pain, my someone I was dating left a joint in my apartment, and I was like at my wit's end, and I was like, <laughs> yes, I'm trying it. But I was in San Francisco at the time, so you know, we, we was around every corner. <laughs> oh, so, but, but I just was like, that's so interesting. Cause yeah, it was not in Virginia, or... around every corner. And um, it was interesting, too, because kind of like the joint, like just like Avital, like I didn't know what I was doing. So right. it was really bad first, and then I was like, oh, God. And then and then we finally figured it out, and now, you know, I don't, I don't have Indeed. massive panic attacks yeah. from around that neighborhood <laughs> naked. <laughs> I'm kidding. That never happened. I'm just <laughs> you can tell up. it's fun. Yeah. By the end, you could, with all you know about this, and you can tell it's well researched because you could basically, you could open your own. Maybe one day. That's right. The right you thing doesn't then. work out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think uh, just the last thing I we just started touching upon what you're working on now, um, and I was like, I'm sorry, what? That sounds so interesting. So I wonder if you might share a little bit sure. about. So my fourth book is called Magical Meet Q. We just sort of announced it, and it is uh, uh, it is about a uh, Jewish woman. So not Jewish. She's a Jewish woman who's a potter, and in the wake of an anti-Semitic attack in her neighborhood, she goes into her backyard really drunk and creates the perfect man, and then buries him under the yard. And when the next day, this really hot, amazing guy that looks exactly like she did in the spell shows up. She's inadvertently left wondering if he's Mr. Perfect or if she summoned a golem. So as I like to say, a Jewish and a golem may love each other, but where will they live? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I think that sounds amazing. Um, so I don't, I don't know if, yeah, if, if we've got questions in the audience, I've, I've got in everything I need to answer. Yeah. Oh, hi, Ms. Walter. Um, what was the inspiration for the uh, bakery in your book? So the bakery. So again, if you want the honest, true, okay, so two things. The Jewish cooking and Jewish food nowadays, ha especially the younger generations, become very artisanal. They want all the things that the non-Jewish world is doing. So no more gefilte to fish, it's tuna tartar, right? No more, uh, you know, lox and bagels. Now we're making smoked salmon barrica. Right, so we, we've gotten very artisanal and fancy, and that's great. I mean, we're, we're all expanding our repertoire. So I wanted to really like focus a little bit on that idea of like these bakeries you see, this kosher food world that's so alive and like bursting with creativity right now. And the other side of it, again, back to sort of like hoorahs <laughs> and yahoos. I mean, it just seemed to fit if we were gonna be talking about pelvic pain um, to, be, to place it in a bakery. It seemed just very, like and foodie to me, so yeah. probably because of the Hamantasha. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, I have so much to say. Uh, I really appreciate the content about the chronic illness as somebody who's been through a lot myself. I'm curious to learn about the process of writing a book as a Jewish American. Obviously, anti-Semitism is still very prevalent. I find myself having to do a lot of education to my, my friends who aren't familiar with Judaism, specifically that we have a very wide range of observance, and there is a very big difference between, for example, somebody who's Orthodox and somebody who's culturally Jewish. And I'm wondering if you can talk about maybe your editing process and what those conversations were like to make sure that your character still felt authentic to you, but were also formed in, in ways that 
you know, could educate the readers and make it more accessible? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a great question because I think one of the sort of misconceptions people have about my books is that I write niche books for a broad audience or I write Jewish books for a non-Jewish audience. And though you would not know it by looking at me now, I grew up secular. I went to public school. I went to a shoddy Hebrew school background. So when I say I write books for Jewish audiences that know nothing just as much as know something, that is, that is absolutely the truth. I write so that anyone who wants an access point to Judaism can find it. So if you're just curious, what's a Shabbat dinner? If you're Jewish and you're like, I've, I've never said a bracha, a, a blessing in my life. I want to give people the tools that I never had and that I had to move to Israel for in order to learn them. Because I think Judaism is unfortunately a religion with uh, barriers to entrance. And it can be incredibly hard to connect to our beautiful faith if, you, if those barriers exist for you. And if in some small way my books allow people to feel that connection, and I don't care if they're Jewish or not. I, I think faith is a good thing. Thinking about God is a good thing. It doesn't have to be my faith. If, if you can find those points, then I feel like I put good into the world, and that's enough. You know, I think that answer. Do you want anti-Semitic? Did you want No, I guess I, I guess I... Did you want anti-Semitic? No, I don't. I don't want it. <laughs> I've seen enough. Uh, I guess my question was... Um, so, for example, at the beginning, you talked about how you didn't realize how Jewish your books were. Yeah. Um, so, did you ever have like a conversation with your editor about how certain things would be perceived, or maybe if you could write a scene in a way that made something more accessible? I'm curious about that. So, they have my editor and publisher have been really great, but they have always sort of trusted me to to know my community. Um, I have moved in lots of Jewish circles, whether that's uh, secular, whether that's more uh, observant. I don't really like to define by movements because I don't define by movements. Um, and so when I write my Jewish world, I try to really write a story about, I will call them engaged Jews, right? So they're engaged, maybe they're not to the letter of the law, maybe they're not halakhic, right? But they are, they are interested and invested in their Jewish world and community. And especially with the matzah ball, I think it was very important to me to show that there's a difference between someone like Jacob, who was more reformed, versus Rachel, who's the daughter of a conservative rabbi, versus a conservatox, let's say that, versus a shmuel, versus a, you know, and, and all of that is valid, and all of that's part of our Jewish world, and all of that um, should be explored in different ways and in different types of stories. I think I try to just, I write Jews who are like me, I think at the end of the day, who are engaged. Thank you. I'll let other people have questions. Yeah. That's a great question. question. It's a great, great question. question. Yeah. Um, you're also reminding me that there's a piece in the book where Avatar talks about how, I think Ethan calls himself inconsistent and she's, She's like drawn to that, or she's drawn. He, he shows some part of his, but then he shows some part of his faith quite he strongly. Knows he's going, yeah, and, she, but he and she's like, keep up. and he doesn't do it consistently. She's like, but I think fun. people, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. Well, I love to fill it. If you know what to fill it, but uh, <laughs> okay. so sexy. But um, <laughs> thinking about to fill it, I'm blushing. Okay, so um, but no, like I think you know, there's a. Something sometimes in Judaism we were always like, they're so religious. And then you go to that person and they're like, no, no, that guy's they're so religious. Or they we always like there's something about Jews where we're always like, we're not good enough. The way we're doing it isn't good enough. And like the thing I just always try to get across to people is like that that's you are where you are, right? And as long as like everything, if you if you're connecting, if you're finding ways to connect, if you're finding your meaning, that's that's more than enough. So I'm just curious, when you write, is your process with an outline and a hallmark ending? Is it 
Okay, so I have a very big imagination, and I learned that if I do not write with an outline, nobody's getting a book. <laughs> it's just going to be like 10,000 pages and all over the place. And I will tell my secret. My secret is I always start with the ending. So for me, I'm all about building to the ending. That's good. Yeah. I think when Don't start with the beginning. Start. I think the one is the thing I'm writing right now is going fast because I have an ending, and the thing that I just spent five years writing, I never had an ending. Yeah, no, you need the ending. The ending is like the most, it's like the build, yeah. you know? I mean, the beginnings are important too, but um, I feel like with the, you know, I was trained as a screenwriter, so the three act structure, and I'm very, very much a classicist with that, and I like my middle beats, and I like, you know, all those things. Yeah, so the ending. The ending is key. You gotta, it's rom-com. You gotta have a big, swoony, 80s, 90s ending, you know? Like, I need it. I need it. Yeah. When did you start brainstorming your next book? I know you just announced recently that you are publishing, you know, the, the next book next August. When, yeah. when did this all start forming? So. By the way, I went to high school with her, just so y'all know. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> it's like a reunion. Um, so you can find out all about how, how very cool I was in high school. <laughs> um, we went rollerblading we, times. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and I was not smoking weed, I'm sure, back then. <laughs> but, uh, so, okay, so uh, if, okay, so another secret. You will notice in the third book, that it, there's pink boxes, pink boxes. Of course there's pink boxes. What are we talking about, right? You will notice in matzo ball, the croissant box comes in a pink box that he, that uh, Dr. Rubenstein buys for Jacob from Paris. You will notice in the second book, uh, the black and white cookies come from that bakery in Brooklyn with the pink box. So I have a story percolating like usually almost years ahead, and I work try to like work it in the bench as it comes. So Magical Meet Cute is, um, I would say that I've wanted to do an anti-Semitism book uh, for a very long time, uh, so this will be, I'm finally getting to do it. And um, yeah, this was the way I could make it work. So you have a literary universe, everything's interconnected. Yes, it's, I like to call it the Camp Ahava universe, which means love. Well. Um, and it basically all the characters have gone to Camp Ahava at one point. And it's, in my mind, it's sort of like a non-denominational Jewish summer camp. So there's a shout out to each of them. Yeah, there are, there are, I give them away, the, t the Camp Ahava t-shirts. And um, yeah, so everyone has gone at some point. And I don't know, I just love the idea of all these camp characters like but, you know, winding up on the mazel board one day. <laughs> Would that be a book? It might be. I like the mazel board. <laughs> um, have you, given your screenwriting background, have you thought about adapting one of your novels to screen? So, yes. Uh, so, Matzo Ball has been optioned and it's in development. And, um, yeah. Yay. Unfortunately, <laughs> thank you. Unfortunately, uh, uh, as you know, the. Um, Writer's strike has put everything <laughs> yeah. off for a while. And there's been interest with Kissing Kosher and Mr. Perfect. Well, so that's so. That was a question. I yeah, so. When well, someone said Hallmark, I'm like, they better. Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> they, they would be lucky. I mean, yeah, you would, you would hope, so. Uh, uh, your, your, your last book, you said there's a goal in the next. Usually that's a pretty dark, potentially violent. I know it's protective, but my recollection of some of the reading is that you lose control of them. They get destructive. They start sneaking out, and then you have to put them down. Um, so interesting. I, I shouldn't be talking so much about the magical meat cute book yet. Uh, what is interesting is so in all my books, I do a lot of Jewish research too. I'm a total Bible nerd. I'm a Talmud nerd. I have a whole Jewish library at home, and I love Safari. If anybody knows what that is. Um, What's interesting about the Golem story is it didn't actually begin that way. It has shifted and changed um, over the centuries. So it actually began as a way for men to sort of create life in the way women did. And then there were female Golems who were like helpers, I guess if you couldn't afford, 
you know, an assistant, you would just make your female golem. Um, and actually, the golem story doesn't become destructive until about the 17th century, when it's taken on by German writers who are not Jewish. So uh, while there are aspects of like, it's never a good idea to create life, that is not historically accurate. That is just our uh, modern day telling of, or the memory we have all kind of learned and learned over the years. But that's not actually the whole truth. So, so just, yeah. Yes. So in terms of that adaptation, would that be a civil appropriation then? Say it again. Well, if the story of the 1700s were adapted in different ways and it's not from their culture, that's appropriation. No, no, no. It, the Golem story is Jewish. So the rabbis originally created uh, the Golem as like life. It was meant to be a, 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 they wanted to be like the women and they wanted to see if they could create life. And then the story shifts and changes as each generation of Jewish people uh, went and took it. And yes, other cultures took the golem story and made it their own as well. But the golem story is originally a, a Jew, I mean, it's a very Jewish story. There might be other types of golem type beings, but it's a Jewish story. Okay, because you mentioned that in the 1700s. Um, the German writers. Yeah, so in, in that instance, I'm, I'm a, in that instance. Oh, that so they appropriate. I mean, I, I suppose they, yeah, I mean, I guess you could make that argument, yeah. I mean, they, they corrupted the story, right, for their own use and for what they need, so. And it's interesting how stories, I have a fourth book, shouldn't be talking about my fourth book. The way stories, you know, we be very Jewish that we, we are told a story, it becomes part of us, and then we become the storyteller, right? So, there's a metaphor. What are you reading? What am I? Oh, right now. And what's the, two things, like what are you reading and what's the favorite book? Okay, so I am right now reading Meet Me in the Middle by Devin Daniels, which I think is so good. I sat next to her uh, at an event recently and I was like, that is a really good book. So it's about, um, you might not want to read it right now because it's like, might get your like ire up, but it's because um, it's like election stuff. But it's basically about two staffers from like different sides of the aisle, and of course they fall in love with each other. But how will they make this work? Um, and she's just so talented. I mean, like you, like you know, some writers their their voice just leaps off the page. Um, if you're looking for a fabulous Jewish book, uh, I gotta give it up. Like always, Felicia Grossman, Mary B. by the Midnight. That's been one of my favorite books this year. Um, uh, Sarah Goodman, Confino, Don't Forget to Write. Another favorite, um, Heidi Shertok, Unorthodox Love. Um, I can also give you some other books. From, I read a lot. Ma'an Gabriel, 12, uh, have it here, 12, nights in Man 12 Hours in Manhattan. Loved it, loved it, loved it. It's a K-pop drama, um, but very deep, and it's about um, the Catholic faith. Um, beautiful, beautiful story. Um, and I read Ghosted by Amanda Klein, also really good. Yeah, so, I mean, I've been very lucky this year to just get so many great books. But right now, Devin Daniels, loving it, loving it, and it's available. Thank you so much. What's my favorite Jewish dessert? I mean, I've never met a dessert I don't like. <laughs> um, let me think. I feel like this is a really good, I want, I want it, I feel like it's gonna be like, so, I guess it would absolutely have to be. I love the hamantash that my husband makes. I do, he makes a great hamantash. I really do love a good hamantash. And I do love a, a good babka, but it has to be like drizzled in the sugar water. And obviously, you can throw them on the ruggala, but if you get the ruggala and marzipan in the shuk in Israel, nothing like this. That's a dairy ruggala. It's really good. <laughs> Go to Jerusalem just for that ruggala. Okay, that's all. That's all. Uh, Did you say marzipan? Marzipan, yeah, it's called marzipan. Right. In the shoe. Seconded. Seconded, yeah, you know, I mean, if you, if you can, yeah. Uh, I think maybe uh, time for a sign. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.